who here is a translator? Wow. Okay, so welcome to today's Translation Slam. My name is Annalise Finnegan, and I'm here today as the co-chair of the PEN America Translation Committee. My other co-chair is Frida Afari, and we are joined here today by Allison Markin Powell, who is our board representative for the Translation Committee. Uh, so, a few words of preamble, PEN America, as many of you will know, is an organization whose mission is to unite writers and their allies to celebrate the power of the written word and champion the freedom to write. This is our 18th PEN World Voices Festival, and since 2005, the festival has stayed true to its original mission, to celebrate the power of storytelling and literature in translation, and to convene global voices across borders, language, and culture. Over the last years, PEN America has tracked an alarming rise in book bans across the United States, and our Freedom to Write Index tracked the cases of over 300 writers who were detained or imprisoned around the world for their writing or exercising their freedom of expression in 2022. Um, for those of you who are new to PEN America, we are a member-driven organization. We have members in every U.S. state and chapter cities across the country. Um, check your program for more information on how to join PEN America as a member. Uh, we thank all of our members who are here, our bookstore partner, Possman Books, for helping us share our author's wonderful work with you today. Finally, I want to share special thanks to the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, the Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York State Council on the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, and Amazon Literary Partnership for their invaluable support of our work. So let's move on to our slam. We're going to begin with Chinese, and then we're going to move on to Spanish. So if I could invite our first panel on, and then I will introduce each of you. Let me start with the pleasure of introductions. Kevin Chen has published several novels, essays, and short story collections in Taiwan. His first English publication, Ghost Town, translated by Daryl Sturck, was long listed for the Penn Translation Prize. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Stacy Mosher is a Brooklyn-based translator, editor, and writer. She translates from Chinese to English and has more than a dozen books and dozens of articles to her credit. Welcome, Stacy. Thank you. <laughs> Lynn King is a writer and translator from Taiwan, and her work has won the Penn Robert J. Dow Short Story Prize for Emerging Writers. Her translations from Mandarin Chinese and Japanese into English have appeared in Asymptote, The Margins, and other publications. So we are going to start by hearing an excerpt from Kevin's newest novel and then two brand new translations. Thank you. So we're going to start in Chinese. A lot of you are like, <laughs> 楼上的好人, 抵达柏林的第一天, 他迷路了, 完蛋了, 冷静, 他告诉自己, 撑开鼻孔, 张开嘴巴, 用力深呼吸, 一定闻得到, 记错了吧, 还是听错了, 他根本闻不到咖啡, 或雪茄, 小弟说的是雪茄吧, 还有咖啡, 没听错吧, 龙虾好热柏林盛夏显然有恶意抓了吹风机温度风速调到最热最强往他鼻孔耳朵嘴巴灌热风扁平的身体膨胀像热气球离地手指开头汗立指甲戳到泛红皮肤身体破洞漏风被重力拉回热烫地面泄气摊在行李箱上嘘嘘窘迫这里是哪里走失的猫走失的狗今天几月几日星期几得过与台湾时差几小时 
柏林与台湾是差几小时。为什么来柏林？为什么匆忙离开柏林？小丽的家在哪里？为什么匆忙匆忙离开台湾？昨天发生什么事？昨天吗？还是好几天了？那几个黑人到底是谁？为什么小弟会答应让他来？大弟在哪里？为什么他想来？龙虾，德国在哪里？柏林在哪里？海马，大弟为什么不接电话？咖啡，雪茄。他心里每个自我提问，似乎都有答案。只要脑子清晰，就能轻易解题。他是高中老师，每天都逼学生考试解题，这有什么难的？但此刻他脑筋热雾弥漫，头皮热带雨，腋下是白日不闻灯，夏天是趋光的凶猛蚊虫，朝腋下冲撞，腋毛着火。身体焦臭，将近一天的飞行，他都没睡着。一闭眼，眼前就会浮现那双手。他被贴着学校围墙，不敢直视那双手，只好抬头看天空。午后多雨闷热，不见太阳，围墙看似无害。原来太阳躲进围墙午觉，水泥墙面烧烫，在他的背上，一家烤肉万家香。黑人的双手从他下腹部往上探索，手心粗力，指腹老茧如地表硬岩，尖锐指甲不怀好意，缓缓刮过他平坦的胸部。抵达喉咙那刻，掌心忽然狂犬，食食指尖锥，用力掐住他的脖，活埋他的尖叫。那双手汗湿漉漉，有烟味、槟榔味，指甲修气整齐，但双手的小指头，指甲皆刻意留长。指甲长度超过无名指，像是四十四号客人。等一下，是四十四号吗？那双手截断他的呼吸。他想到的不是求生，而是：请问你是四十四号吗？园林四十四号客人？不，你太年轻了，不可能是同一个人。先生，先生，拜托放开我，让我查一下笔记本。黑衣人说。林老师，我有一个问题想请教你，请问老师，你弟在哪里？我放开手，你就要马上跟我说，跟林老师报告一下。我两手不听话，我控制不了他们，尤其是遇到不老实、不肯说实话的人，他们会立刻抓狂。我上次才不小心用我的小拇指的指甲戳瞎了一个人的眼睛，哎呀，真的不是故意的啦，但我太气了，所以控制不了自己的手。林老师乖哦，不要叫，不要怕，我倒数五秒就会放开。拜托你不要让我生气哦。五、四、三，准备好了吗？这样的窒息感并不陌生。他曾他曾经被这样用力掐过。小时候那个黑夜，冷气机隆隆雷鸣，他张开眼睛看那个人逼他张开眼睛。三百九十九号，三百九十九号说：“闭上眼睛，这次就不算。”小弟好安静，大弟不在家，他想求救，母亲捂住他口鼻，不准他尖叫。母亲无声尖叫。夏天的蚊子是不是都停在他脸上吸血？因为母亲的手不断撞击他的脸。谢谢母亲帮他打脸上的蚊子。母亲赏他好几个耳光，声音颤抖，压低声音说。不准哭，眼睛张开。但是母亲自己在哭，忽然又一个耳光，跟你说眼睛张张开，听不懂是不是？叫你们笑，听不懂是不是？痛吗？他忘了，他想不起来当时到底痛不痛。但他记得小弟的脸，眼睛真好大，跟他对望，手伸向他微笑。小弟的眼睛好美，好大，好深，睫毛棕榈叶，瞳孔宇宙鼻子峻岭，同一个母亲，为什么他们的眼睛轮廓毫不相似？说姐弟没人性，小弟的父亲一定不是他的父亲，他的生父给了他他比小眼薄唇，就算笑起来还是一脸苦。小弟的生父一定是个俊男，给了小弟好眼好鼻，小弟露齿笑，微微皱眉，每一根细致的眉毛都站起来，酒窝尖叫，瞳孔里的宇宙缓缓塌陷，窗外的柏林好雨死。窗外的园林，好好雨肆虐。他拖着大行李走过柏林安静的街道，行李箱轮子在石板路上挣扎，路面上的石子长时间被践踏，怨气浓，以崎岖阻挠。行李箱数次挣脱他的拉扯
，真的好安静。午后的陌生街道，无风无人，怎么可能？这不是德国首都吗？不是有几百万人口吗？为什么这么安静？人呢？揉眼左看右看，就是找不到龙下与海马。手机没电了，小弟的地址存在手机里面。完了，真的完蛋了，一定是走错路了。The Good Neighbor by Kevin Chen. Her first day in Berlin, and she's lost her way. I'm done for. Okay, okay, calm down. She tells herself. Open your nostrils and mouth, and take a deep breath, and you're sure to pick up the scent. Has she remembered wrong, or did she hear wrong? She can't smell coffee or cigars. Didn't little brother say cigars and coffee? She didn't hear wrong, did she? Lobster. It's so hot. Midsummer in Berlin is just brutal. She grabs her blow dryer and turns it on full blast. Its hot air gushing over her nostrils, ears, and lips. Her flattened body swelling and levitating like a balloon. She wipes the sweat from her brow. Her fingernails jabbing holes in her pink flesh. Air leaking out until gravity pulls her back to the scorching hot earth, and she lands deflated and immobilized on top of her suitcase, gasping for breath. Where is she? Lost dog. Cat, a lost dog. What's the date? What day of the week? What's the time difference between Germany and Taiwan? How many hours difference between Berlin and Yuanlin? Why is she in Berlin? Why did she leave Yuanlin in such a rush? Where's little brother's home? Why did she leave Taiwan in such a rush? What happened yesterday? Yesterday or many days ago? Who were those people dressed in black? Why did little, little brother agree to let her come? Where is her other brother? What's making her think of that? Lobster? Where is Germany? Where is Berlin? Seahorse? Why isn't her other brother answering the phone? Coffee? Cigars? Every question she asks herself seems to have an answer. If she just clears her mind, she can easily sort it all out. She's a high school teacher. She spends every day forcing students to solve problems. So what's so hard about that? But at this moment, her brain is engulfed in a hot mist. Her scalp a tropical rainforest. Her armpits mosquito zappers. Summer is ferocious mosquitoes drawn to the light, ramming themselves into her armpits. Her armpit hair catching on fire. Her body giving off a scorched stench. She didn't sleep a wink on the nearly day-long flight. The minute she closed her eyes, that pair of hands would float up before her. Her back adheres to the school's outer wall. Afraid to look straight at those hands, she lifts her gaze toward the sky. The afternoon is sultry and overcast. The sun nowhere to be seen. The wall looked harmless, but it turns out that the sun has ducked behind the wall for a nap, and the wall's cement surface is roasting hot. Her back giving off the fragrance of Wanjashan barbecue sauce. <laughs> the hands of the black-clad man begin exploring her from her belly upward. The palms rough and the fingertips as calloused as the earth's crust. Sharp fingernails raking maliciously and slowly across her flat chest, but then when they reach her throat, the palms suddenly become rabid. Ten fingers forming a cone that throttle her neck and smother her screams. The hands are clammy and smell of tobacco and betel nut. The fingernails carefully manicured, except for the pinky fingers, where the fingernails have been grown out and extend beyond the tops of the ring fingers, like customer number number forty-four. Wait. Is it number forty-four? The hands are cutting off her breath, but instead of begging for her life, she asks, "Excuse me, are you number forty-four? Customer number forty-four from Yunlin? No, you're too young. You can't be the same man, sir. Sir, please let go of me so I can check my notebook." The man in black says, "Teacher Lin, I have a question for you. Teacher, tell me where your brother is. I'm going to let go, and then you tell me right away." I have to inform you that my hands don't know how to behave. I can't control them, especially when they come across someone who's dishonest and unwilling to tell the truth. They just go crazy. Last time I got careless and gouged out someone's eye with my little fingernail. Whoops! I really didn't mean to, but I got so mad I couldn't control my own hands. Teacher Lin, just be good. Don't scream and don't be afraid. I'm going to count down from five and then let go. Please don't make me mad. Five, four, three. Are you ready? She's used to this suffocating feeling. 
She's been choked like this before, back when she was small. That summer night, the humming air conditioner, she opened her eyes. That man forced her to open her eyes. Number 399. Number 399 said, open your eyes. This time doesn't count. Her little brother was very quiet. Her other little brother wasn't at home. She wanted to beg for help. Mother covered her nose and mouth to keep her from screaming. Mother screamed silently. Didn't the summer mosquitoes all land on her face and suck her blood? Because mother's hand kept slapping her face. She thanked mother for helping her smack the mosquitoes off her face. Mother slapped her several times, her voice quivering as she said in a hushed voice, don't cry, keep your eyes open. But mother herself was crying. Suddenly, another slap on the face. I told you to open your eyes, but you didn't understand, did you? I told you both to smile, but you didn't understand, did you? Did it hurt? She's forgotten. She can't remember if it actually hurt back then, but she remembers little brother's face, his eyes very wide as he stared at her, his hands reaching for her as he smiled. Little brother's eyes are beautiful, large and deep, the eyelashes long and luscious palm fronds, pupils like the cosmos, his nose a noble ridge. How could children of the same mother have such completely different eyes and facial contours? People never believe their siblings. Little brother must have come from a different father. Her own father gave her a snub nose, squinty eyes, and thin lips that make her look bitter even when she smiles. Little brother's father must have been a handsome man to give him such lovely features. Little brother's lips parted in a grin, his wrinkled brow making his eyebrow hairs bristle, his dimples screaming, the cosmos in his eyes slowly collapsing. Outside the window, Yun Lin was pummeled by a drenching downpour. She drags her bulky suitcase through the quiet streets of Berlin, the wheels catching on the rough flagstone path, its stones trampled into fragments over time and spitefully obstructive, the suitcase fighting to free itself again and again. It's so quiet, this unfamiliar street, windless and empty in the afternoon. How is that possible? Isn't this Germany's capital city? Isn't it supposed to have a population of millions? Why is it so quiet? Where is everyone? She rubs her eyes and looks left and right, but still can't see a lobster or a seahorse. Her cell phone battery is dead, and little brother's address is in the cell phone. She's done for, really done for. She must have taken the wrong turn. It's her first day in Berlin and she is lost. I'm so fucked. She tells herself to be calm. She flares her nostrils and opens her mouth in order to deepen her breaths. Yes, she'll definitely be able to smell it. Is she misremembering or had she misheard in the first place? She can't smell any coffee nor can she smell any cigars. That's what baby brother had said, wasn't it? Cigars and coffee? And what was it, a lobster? So. Hot! Something feels malicious about Berlin's heat, as though summer itself is personally blasting hot air into her nostrils, ears, and mouth with a hairdryer set on high, filling her flattened body until she swells and lifts from the earth like a balloon. She wipes away the sweat on her forehead, and her fingernails graze the reddened skin, tearing a hole in her hot air body. Gravity tugs her back to a sizzling ground, and she deflates against her suitcase, short of breath. Where is she? Lost cat? Lost dog? What day, what month, what year is it? What's the time difference between Germany and Taiwan? What about between Berlin and Yuanling? When did she come to Berlin? Why did she leave Yuanling in such a rush? Where does baby brother live? Why did she leave Taiwan in such a rush? What happened yesterday? Was it yesterday or was it many days ago? Who was the person in black? Why did baby brother agree for her to come? Where in the world is little brother? Why does she even want to come? Lobster? Where's Germany? Where's Berlin? Seahorse? Why wouldn't little brother pick up his phone? Coffee? Cigars? She usually has an answer for every question that she poses to herself. Her mind, when clear, finds it easy to solve problems, for she is a high school teacher who forces students to solve problems every day. Answering questions? Easy. But in this moment, her brain is filled with a hot fog. Her scalp is a tropical downpour. Her armpits are white-hot mosquito lamps, and the summer is a swarm of ruthless insects charging headfirst at the lights under her arms until the scraggly hair there bursts into flames, giving her body a burnt stink. She hasn't slept a wink not even on the long flight that took almost a full day, for whenever she closes her eyes, she can see those hands again, those hands, her back flush against the school wall. 
She hadn't dared look directly at the hands and so instead looked up at the sky, an overcast and humid afternoon sky with no hint of the sun. The wall had seemed harmless at first, but she soon discovered that the sun was in fact taking a nap within the concrete, which began barbecuing a feast on her back. The person in black was exploring with his hands, starting from her lower abdomen and moving upward. The palms were rough, the calluses were hard as boulders, the sharp nails were full of malice as they scraped across her flat chest. The moment they reached her throat, the palm was suddenly a rabid dog and the fingers sharpened owls, seizing her neck, burying her screams alive. The hands were slick with sweat and smelled of cigarettes and betel nuts, and the nails were neatly trimmed except for those of the little fingers, which had been left to grow past the tips of the ring fingers, just like customer number 44's nails. Wait, was it customer number 44? The hands were choking her, yet what she wanted was not to breathe, but to ask, excuse me, are you number 44? You unlink customer number 44? No, you're far too young. You can't possibly be the same person. Sir, sir, please let me go so that I can check my notebook. The person in black said, Miss Lin, I have a question I'd like to ask you. Tell me, where's your brother? You have to tell me as soon as, like, as, like, as I let go, okie dokie. You're a teacher, so I should report myself to you. Teacher, my hands don't listen to me. I can't control them, especially when I come across people who are dishonest, who don't tell the truth. These hands, they just go crazy. Just the other day, I accidentally poked someone's eye out with my pinky. It wasn't on purpose, miss, but I was so angry, and when I'm that angry, I just can't control my hands, you see? So please be good, Miss Teacher. Don't scream, don't be scared. I'm going to count down from five and let go, so don't make me angry. Five, four, three, ready? The feeling of suffocation, suffocation wasn't new to her. She'd been choked like this before. She'd been young. It had been a summer night. The air conditioner had been rumbling thunderously. She'd opened her eyes. The person had made her open her eyes. Number 399. Number 399 had said, close your eyes, we'll forget about it this time. Baby brother had been quiet. Little brother hadn't been home. She'd wanted to cry for help, but mother wouldn't let her. Mother had covered her nose and mouth. Mother had screamed soundlessly. Had the summer mosquitoes been feasting on the blood of her cheeks? Why else would mother's hands have smacked her again and again? Thank you, mother, for killing the mosquitoes that were sucking on my face. Mother had said in a low, shaking voice, don't you dare cry, open your eyes. But mother herself had been crying. Another slap, I told you to open your eyes. I told you guys to smile. What, don't you know what it means to open your eyes and smile? Had it hurt? She's forgotten. She can no longer remember whether or not it had hurt. But she remembers baby brother's face, how those wide eyes had looked into hers, how the hand had reached toward hers, how he had smiled. Baby brother's eyes had been so beautiful, so big, so deep. The lashes were palm leaves, the irises little cosmoses, the nose a mountain range. Mm -hmm. They shared the same mother, so why didn't they share any of the same features? Growing up, people didn't believe that they were siblings. Baby brother's father couldn't have been hers, for her father had given her a flat nose, narrow eyes, and reedy lips, the overall effect of which was that she always looked miserable, even when she smiled. Mm -hmm. No, baby brother's father must have been a very handsome man. When baby brother smiled that night, showing his teeth and frowning slightly, every delicate hair on his brows had stood erect. His dimples had turned as sharp as a scream, and the universes in his eyes had slowly collapsed into themselves. Outside the window, heavy rain had torn through Renling. She drags her large suitcase down Berlin's quiet streets. The wheels struggle against the cobblestones that, full of resentment from being trampled on for centuries, use their craggy bodies to exact revenge on her. More than once, the luggage wrestles free from her grip. It is so quiet in these strange, breezeless, peopleless streets. How is such quiet even possible? Isn't this the capital of Germany with a population of millions? Where are the millions? She rubs her eyes and looks left and right, but still she sees no lobster, no seahorse. Her phone is out of battery. Baby brother's address is saved on her phone. Fucked. She really is fucked. She must have gone the wrong way. Okay. So it's a, it's a hot summer day here in New York. Uh, the midsummer in Berlin is just brutal. Um, something feels malicious about Berlin's heat. These are the two versions we have in our translation. So we were talking before the event in the back room, and all of us who are translators were saying, well, what about that expletive blow dryer? So I wonder if we could start with, <laughs> with taking apart that particular sentence, Stacy and Lynn. Well, personally, I think... Well,
Oh, sorry. I, I like Lynn's translation better than mine. After I read it, I thought, I should have written it that way. <laughs> because honestly, when I read that, I was like, what's going on here? I didn't know. And if I were really translating this book, I would have highlighted it in yellow and come back to it when I was further into the book and got a better idea of what's going on. But at that point, I was like, why is you know she inflating and then poking holes in her face and deflating? Where did the blow dryer come from? But I can see, I think that Lynn was more correct in just comparing it to the, saying that the summer was acting like a dr blow dryer rather than there was a blow dryer. <laughs> Honestly, um, I mean, reading that was the opening paragraph. Like, like say, so we only got an excerpt, um, and maybe mine just reflects what I felt when I first read <laughs> the opening. Was that I'm so fucked. Like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't. Where did, where's the hair dryer coming from? What's going on? Um, so I, you know, read it a lot of times, and that's kind of what I decided. Like, the subject of the sentence was was the summer instead of her. But it definitely, yeah, it took many tries. I just wanted to point out that actually a, uh, I was doing a reading in, in Taipei, so like a mom actually came to me. She asked me about this, even in Chinese. She was like, where is the, where is the boot dryer? I was like, it's, it's, it's the summer. It's a, it's a metaphor, you know, it's literature. And she's like, is that grammatically correct? You know? So it happened even in Chinese. So it's like, yeah, it's just my, my writing. My writing in Chinese is, come on, you have to say that, it's a bit complicated, right? So, yeah. Well, we did promise to share what ChatGPT would do with this text. <laughs> so, Berlin Summer seems to be ill-intentioned. Hmm. She fell back to the hot ground feeling exhausted and embarrassed on her luggage. Mm -hmm. yeah, very different. So I'd love to turn it to the audience. We have time for at least two questions. So would anyone like to go first with questions for Kevin, Stacy, and Lynn? Yes. Uh, I, I don't speak Chinese, but I'm very interested in the issue of the translation of expletives. Because what struck <laughs> me initially was you know, done for vis-a-vis -vis fucked. fucked. <laughs> and I just, I, and I, as, and I believe that if you don't share the native, if you're not completely bilingual, your sensation of how severe an expletive is in the other language may not be the same. Anyway, I was interested in your criteria for determining how strongly to translate the curse word or not curse word in the other language. Oh, um, I mean, it, it's not an ex it's not an expletive, I guess, in the Chinese language. Um, but well done, no. well well done. Done, no. but I I'd, I'd seen Kevin read um, on like social media before, and I felt like that was maybe the tone. <laughs> <laughs> you are absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. And when you read yeah. it just now, I was like, yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I don't have anything against expletives. I use them. Frequently, myself. <laughs> yeah. I chose to not use it in this case, although my initial um, impulse was to say, I'm screwed. But then because I saw, okay, this is a lady school teacher, and she You're seems right. rather reserved, You're and right. so she yeah. might not say that. She might say something, you know, a little more reserved. So that's why I changed it, but it was strictly... I could have, if, you know, I read the rest of the book and she, you know, lashes out and really, you know, drops an F-bomb, then I might have gone back and changed it in the first sentence. But, you know, I would have wanted to be more familiar with the character before I, I gave her that freedom of expression. Which is amazing because the lady, the teacher, uh, her nickname in this book is the last spinster in the town. Oh, wow. Yeah, so she is um, um, famously, uh, famously, infamously um, conservative in this school. She's not popular at all. All the students, all the kids hate her. <laughs> um, so, yeah. The amazing. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Amazing. Another question. Yes. One of the things, the notable differences between the... Um, one of the notable differences in the in the readings that you you gave is um, how sort of syncopated and cadenced uh, Kevin's reading was when compared with yours. Although I, 
intuit that there were efforts made to reflect that as well. But I'm, I'm also curious to know whether that rhythmic aspect of Kevin's prose is notice, noticeable also on the page and whether you are cognizant of that as when you were attempting to translate also the rhythm and the voice. Um, I think the, the section with the, all the questions was definitely really noticeable. I think in English there might have been an instinct to connect some of the questions and I think I did a couple um, because the repetition is definitely intentional. But in the Mandarin, you get you, you have so fewer characters, um, so that it doesn't feel as repetitive, and it's almost like I mean it's a pictorial language, so you kind of glimpse at it and you know r roughly what it's about. Um, whereas in the English, you really kind of have to go through like what is the when is the what is the time difference between the you know. Um, so I think an effort, like you said, was made at preserving the cadence, but some of it, I guess, in the English would have felt quite laborious. Yeah, I would say the same. That was my also, my, my feeling about how to go about it. Well, it, it just doesn't necessarily work as well, you know, in one language as in another. Some rhythms translate better than others. Which is the expression we say a lot in Mandarin in Chinese as well, when it's a really hot day. Yeah, yeah we yeah. say we can fry an egg on this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is a, a rare opportunity to have two translators of the same text. So Stacy and Lynn, I wonder if either of you has a question for the other. Oh, I, w I had a I question love that. about um, yeah. <laughs> question. Yeah, question, teacher, <laughs> about the 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 kind of pronouns, I guess, or not the proper nouns, um, the forms of address. Um, mm. So, teacher, little brother, other little brother. Such a headache. Uh, yeah, I think, because they sound very stilted in English a lot of times. Right, yeah. They don't sound natural, yeah. and so that's I come across that problem. Every once in a while, where I think, oh, I don't really want to. Especially, you got, you got a, the youngest brother and then the second youngest brother. I know. And if you say <laughs> second youngest brother, it just sounds like, oh. But on the other hand, that you know, you want to distinguish between the two. So I'm like, other brother? That's not right either. It, it's very hard to get the yeah. a happy medium on those. Yeah, I, I wish when I saw yours, I was like, I should have just gone with teacher. <laughs> you know, I was like, what, what am I doing, Miss? Oh. Well, it, it is hard because it sounds weird to say teacher sometimes too. Yeah. Like, teacher, teacher. <laughs> it's yeah. well. When I was difficult. learning English in Taiwan, we were required to call our teacher teacher yes. Ling yes. or yes. teacher Chen or teacher. Right. And then eventually, I went to English department and I was told, you know, by American professor that this is wrong. Yeah. And <laughs> you cannot say this. Like, yeah, but that's yeah. that. Exp that's an expression we use a lot in high school. We always call the teacher, teacher Lang, teacher this, and yeah, even, I don't know, so it's, it's, it's quite common, but obviously it's not being used here in the States, you know. Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm sure you've come across this more than once where you want to be true to the culture, of the original culture, yeah. but if you are really perfectly true to it, it sounds weird in, in English. Yeah. Yeah. And you, there's that conflict that often comes up. What do you do? Do you make it something that the English language reader can accept and find pleasurable? Or do you try to s say, well, this is how the Taiwanese actually talk to each other. Yeah. And it should be reflected that way in, in the translation. I, I've gone both directions. I, I think you can't always be consistent on these things. I think there's, it's really tricky because this term, lao shi, teacher, in Mandarin, it's, it's commonly used as, as a way to, uh, to talk to someone that you respect. Yes. Like, I, yes. I'm yes. Chen Lao Shi, I'm teacher Chen. Yeah. In Hong Kong, in China, in Taiwan as well, you know. And I hate it so much because I'm always, <laughs> because I am not a teacher, right? I always say, stop calling me teacher, but it's always, it, it, Whenever you're talking to someone, like you, Stacy Lao Shi, 
That is, uh, yeah, it's a way to make sure that you show respect. But you cannot translate that into English because it simply doesn't make, make any yeah, sense, so right? That's master. Master. <laughs> Can you? <laughs> master <laughs> Stacy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, and then it's well, weird, right? And so I don't even know how do. You, yeah. So that's. I've yeah. had the yeah. opposite experience where everyone, is, you know, is addressing a, a respected person as Lao Shir, Lao Shir, and Lao I'm like. Mr. Mr. And I think, oh, I'm sounding really disrespectful. But I, yeah. it sounds weird for me to say, you know, well, sure. I, it's not something I'm familiar with. So even in Chinese, I don't say Lao Shi, I say Xin Yeah, I know. <laughs> and it's not, I, I feel like I'm maybe insulting the person by not You probably are. <laughs> 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 but just remember, right? Lao Shi is a term that you use a lot when you're trying to show respect. Yeah. So you say it first. Yeah, so Lao Lao Shi, yeah, yeah. In this country, like, some of the PhD teachers don't want you to always call him a doctor. Please, as a medical doctor, call him Mr. or a former yeah. teacher. Yeah. That's what they say. Don't abuse that. Yeah. When you get to high school, even they say that you're old enough to know what a PhD as a medical doctor is, right? That's what some teachers don't want you to call him a doctor. <laughs> that's so true. It's Lynn, just, yeah. Unless you have an MD degree, that's it. Lynn, the last word, I think. Me? Oh, yeah. well, I was thinking when you were when we were just talking about this. Um, Juan, I'm glad I didn't call you Tenlao. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank like, you. Hey, Kevin. Yeah, yes, what's that's up? Great. I love you. I love you for that. <laughs> but you that know. too, that some languages, um, you know, Japanese has a very similar equivalent, and that's become more known in the English, and they can kind of get away with like the sensei. Sensei. Yeah. And people yeah. in English would know what that means, but yeah. I guess we haven't gotten Lao Shi to that point. Yeah. And maybe. <laughs> We should? No, we, <laughs> no? Should, we should. I hate that. I hate okay, that. Okay. We should never we won't establish do it. that. It's just <laughs> terrible. Yeah. It makes you sound old and cranky. Yeah. Just, <laughs> yeah. Because literally, Lao means old. Uh, and Shi is like uh, someone who is teaching or a master. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, if it's okay, I'll just call you Kevin then. Yes! And thank yeah, you, I love that. and thank Stacy, thank and you, thank Stacey. Lynn. Thank and you. to the audience, we're going to do a chair shuffle now, and if you could applaud the whole way through, that would be cool. <laughs> Continuing on, it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce Maria Fernanda Ampuero, who is a writer and journalist from Ecuador. In 2021, her book Human Sacrifices was a finalist for the Tigre Juan Price Award and the Echo Center and Hay Festival Writers Award. Um, to her left is... To her left is D.P. Snyder, who is a bilingual writer and translator from Spanish. Her translation of Monica Levin's Coyoacan a la carte was nominated for a Pushcart Prize. She serves on the Pan America Translation Committee. Thank you for being here, Dorothy. And finally, Samantha Schnee is the founding editor of Words Without Borders. Her translations of Carmen Belusa's work have been shortlisted for the Pen Translation Prize and the Mario Vargas Llosa Biennial Novel Prize. She is the recipient of a 2023 National Endowment of the Arts Literature Fellowship. Welcome. This story is also really going to be a treat for everyone. Bueno, eh, muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. Eh, estoy muy emocionada porque Kevin es extraordinario y de verdad con tan poco, tan tan poco de tu literatura nos dejaste. Yo estoy temblando con esta novela. O sea, estoy, no sé ustedes, pero estoy esperándola como Necesito esta novela, es mi tipo de literatura. So, first of all, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited and 
after Kevin, who's such an extraordinary writer. I was so little of your literature. I'm just absolutely on tenterhooks. I'm just dying to. I, I have to get this novel. <laughs> in Spanish, please. <laughs> no, no, in English, in English. <laughs> um, so, um, I speak a little bit English, but I'm going to read in Spanish. Um, esto se llama Colonas. Y tiene una cita de Italo Calvino que dice, el infierno de los vivos no es algo que será. Hay uno, es aquel que existe ya aquí, el infierno que habitamos todos los días. Se iban. ¿Qué podíamos hacer nosotras? Y decir, ¿qué podíamos decir nosotras que impidiera nada? Preparamos conservas y salazones, hicimos atadillos de ropa, cosimos una imagen de la Virgen en un pliegue de la vela mayor. Rezamos, rezamos, rezamos. Santa María, Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros los pecadores. <risa> Decían que iban a llevar a Dios a otras partes donde no lo conocían. ¿Quiénes? ¿Dónde están esas personas que no conocen a Dios? Y si no conocen a Dios, ¿a quién le rezan cuando sufren? ¿Ante quién se arrodillan cuando han pecado? Y si no conocen el pecado, ¿son más felices, más libres, más perversos? Ni siquiera saben a dónde llegarán y quiénes los recibirán. ¿Serán peligrosos? ¿Serán amistosos? ¿No los matarán? Eso, todo eso nos preguntábamos entre nosotras. Ellos ordenaban, mujer, haz esto. Mujer, haz lo otro. Nosotras no parábamos de camino a, a, nos parábamos de camino a algún recado a mirar el mar y a mirar a los monstruos de madera. ¿Cómo es posible que todo esto, los hijos, el hogar, la mujer en la cama tibia, no le sea suficiente? ¿Cómo es posible que los llame una sombra de madrugada y salgan de sus casas como hechizados a su encuentro? Por la noche las velas se hinchaban y deshinchaban y hacían un ruido de látigo, de respiración monstruosa. Las mayores, agoreras, nos repetían mientras lavábamos la ropa contra la piedra. Van a pasar cosas siniestras. Ese viaje cambiará la tierra. Cambiará la tierra, decían, y eso no es bueno. Les decía, le decíamos al hombre, no vayas, no vayas, hombre, no vayas. Pero ellos se zafaban como si nuestras manos fueran medusas que picaban con ardor insoportable. Que ocupáramos nuestro lugar, eso decían que nuestro lugar era la mierda de los niños, la colada, secar bien los embutidos y envasar las aceitunas y las sardinillas. Nosotras también íbamos a morir en ese viaje. Cambiará la tierra, decían las ancianas, y la tierra somos nosotras. Cada dos meses viene un doctor jovencito con un maletín muy viejo. Alguna vez le explicó a alguien que era, de un, era un misionero y que ese misionero se le regaló antes de morir. Parece que se querían porque el doctorcito anda remendando ese maletín con trozos de cuero que encuentra por ahí. Y si algún día fue negro, ahora es rojo y café y amarillo tostado. Todas nos arremolinamos cuando desde la parada de buses nos avisan que viene el doctorcito. Revisa sobre todo a los niños y todos le les hacen menear la cabeza. Los niños no tienen la orina clara, las erupciones en las piernas y en los brazos parecen musgo rojo y los chicos se rascan y las uñas les quedan ensangretadas les oye los pulmones y suspira. Después juega con ellos y hace que los niños le escuchen a él el corazón. Los niños no suspiran porque el corazón del doctorcito está bien, pero el de nuestros hijos no. Es el agua, dice. Es el aire, dice. Es la tierra, dice. La tierra ya no es lo que era. Cambió la tierra. Cambió desde lo más profundo. Y la tierra somos nosotras. ¿Hasta ahí? Sí. ¿Sí? ¿Sí? ¿Sigo? ¿Hasta aquí? Ah, no. Sí, yo. Ok. Ok. <risa> Sorry. Bajamos la cabeza porque aunque no podemos cambiar el agua, el aire o la tierra, sí podemos sentirnos culpables. Eso siempre. Debimos irnos a la ciudad cuando pudimos, a trabajar de lo que sea, a mendigar. Debimos abandonar la casa, la selva, el origen, la lengua, la cultura, nuestros animales, nuestras plantas, nuestros ríos, nuestros muertos, nuestros dioses, nuestras voces. 
Debimos sacar de aquí a los niños antes de que se les cayera la piel a trozos. O los pulmones le sonaran de una manera que hace que el doctor suspire de tristeza. Pero entonces, ¿qué tendríamos? Aunque, ¿qué tenemos de verdad? Los hijos y las madres y las esposas nos quedamos en el puerto llorando. Siempre es así, ¿no? Los hombres se suben a los monstruos de madera y, de, y las mujeres de pie, mirando, sentimos un mal viento en el corazón, que es una mezcla de terror y pena y quién sabe qué más cosas que guardaremos en silencio para siempre, que jamás ninguna sabrá poner en palabras y se heredarán, se heredarán, se heredarán. Las velas de los monstruos de madera se ponen piponas, como embarazadas, y van llevándose, mecidos por el agua y la sal, como úteros terribles a nuestros hombres. Nadie sabe si volverán. Y aunque vuelvan, ¿quiénes serán? ¿Qué cosas habrán hecho? ¿Los reconoceremos? Hay una cosa que repiten las beatas. El pecado mata más que la muerte, porque mata para siempre. Los días que tienen libres, ellos llegan turbios. La paga de la semana se ha ido en un brebaje fétido que venden ahí mismo en la explotación. Llegan otros, convertidos en hombres que ninguna quisiera tener que recibir en su casa que ningún niño o niña quisiera tener de padre. Están cargados de destrucción. Han matado, matado y matado. Árboles, monos, pericos, culebras, peces. Matar es su trabajo. Hacer huecos es su trabajo. Hacer huecos para que el líquido negro mate la vida es su trabajo. Lo demás va al agua y al aire. No quieren oír de las piernas y los brazos en carne viva de los niños, ni de los pulmones que ponen triste al doctorcito. Quieren pegar a los niños y pegar a las mujeres. Quieren pegarse entre ellos y quedar tirados en la tierra, abrazándola como a una madre. Quizás, quién sabe, pidiéndole perdón. Dice la mamá sabia que estamos malditos desde hace años. Muchos, más de los que hemos aprendido a contar. ¿Cómo acabamos con la maldición, mamá sabia? Le preguntamos cuando se pone oscura. Cuando fuma de su tabaco de ver lo que nadie más puede ver. Y llena del olor del palo santo su casucha muriéndonos, muriéndonos todos, ellos y nosotros, hasta que no quede nada más que la madre tierra recuperando lo que es suyo. Pero ¿y si nos morimos? ¿Quién va a contar la historia? ¿Quién? Nadie va a querer escuchar una historia tan triste. Samantha will read, and as many of you may have noticed, she has been editing her translation on the fly. <laughs> It's true. Uh, <laughs> this is a draft. It has the word draft right at the top. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, here it goes. Colonized by Maria Fernanda Ampuero. The hell of the living is not something that will be. If there is one, it is what is already here, the hell we live in every day. Italo Cavino, translated by William Weaver. The women kept going, what could we do or say? What could we say that would stop any of this? We pickled and preserved, prepared salt fish and cured meat. We made bundles of clothing, We sewed the image of the Virgin into a fold of the great sail. We prayed, we prayed, we prayed. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. They said they were going to bring God to the places where he remained unknown. Who? Where are these people who don't know God? And if they don't know God, to whom do they pray when they suffer? Before whom do they kneel when they sin? And if they don't know sin, Are they happier, freer, more wicked? They have no idea how far they'll go or whom they'll meet. Sorry. Will they be dangerous, friendly? Will they kill our men? This, all of this, is what we asked ourselves. They demanded, woman, do this. Woman, do that. Running an errand, we stopped to look at the sea and at the wooden monsters. How is it possible that all of this, their children, their homes, their women in warm beds, is not enough for them? 
How is it possible that a shadow comes to call for them in the middle of the night and they leave their homes as if bewitched? At night, the sails inflated and deflated, making a whipping sound like a monster breathing. While we did our laundry on the stones, our elder women repeated ominously, dire things will come to pass. This journey will change the earth. It will change the earth, they said, and not for the better. We said to the men, don't go, don't go, sir, don't go. But they slipped away as if our hands were jellyfish, stinging and burning unbearably. We should stay in our places, they said. Our place was with the kids and their shit, the laundry, drying the meat, and canning olives and sardines. We would also die on this journey. The earth would change, the old woman said, and we are the earth. Every two months, a young doctor with a very old bag comes to visit. He once told someone that it had belonged to a missionary who gave it to him before he died. It seems that they had a deep affection for each other because the young doctor repairs the bag with bits of leather he finds, such that where it once was black, now it is red and brown and burnt yellow. We all crowd around when the news from the bus stop is that the young doctor is coming. He's most occupied by the children, who all cause him to shake his head. The children's urine is dark. The rashes on their arms and legs look like red moss. They scratch until their fingernails are bloody. He listens to their lungs and sighs. Then he plays with them and lets them listen to his heart. The children don't sigh because the young doctor's heart is healthy but our children's hearts are not. It's the water, he says. It's the air, he says. It's the earth, he says. The earth is not what it used to be. The earth changed, changed from its depths, and we are the earth. We hang our heads because though we cannot change the water or the air or the earth, we can still feel responsible, always. We ought to go into the city whenever we can to work, doing anything, to beg. We ought to leave our homes, the wilderness, where we came from, our language, our culture, our animals, our plants, our rivers, our dead, our gods, our voices. We ought to get our children out before their skin starts to fall off in strips or their lungs begin to make a sound that makes the doctors sigh with grief. But then, what would we have left? Although... Do we really have anything at all? The children and mothers and wives remain behind in the port crying. It's always that way, isn't it? The men board the wooden monsters and we women stand watching, feeling an ill wind in our hearts mm -hmm. that's a mixture of terror and sadness and all the other things we will harbor in silence forever that none of us will ever know how to put into words and which will be passed down from generation to generation to generation. The sails of the wooden monsters become bloated as if pregnant and carry away our men, rocked in the salt and the water by those terrible uteri. No one knows whether they will return and even if they do, who will they have become? What will they have done? Will we recognize them? The blessed have a saying, sin is a far worse killer than death because it kills once and for all. On their days off, they come home groggy. Their weekly wages spent on a fetid concoction they sell right there at the oil field. Other men arrive, become men no woman would wish to receive in her home, whom no child would wish to call father, full of destruction. They have killed and killed and killed. Trees, monkeys, parrots, snakes, fish. Killing is their job. Clearing spaces is their job. Clearing spaces so that the black wicked liquid can kill life. That's their job. And what remains of it enters the water and the air. They don't want to hear about the open wounds on the arms and legs of the children or the lungs that make the doctor sad. They want to beat the children and beat the women. They want to beat each other until they collapse, embracing the earth like a mother, perhaps, who knows, asking forgiveness. 
Mama Sabia says we've been cursed for years now, many years, more than we know how to count. How did we come to be cursed, Mama Sabia, we ask, when she grows inscrutable, when she smokes her tobacco to see what no one else can, and her hut fills with the scent of Palo Santo. Dying, all of us dying, them and us, until nothing is left but Mother Earth, regaining what is hers. But if we die, who will tell the story? Who? No one will want to hear such a sorrowful tale. Thank you. Women of the Earth. The hell of the living is not something that is to come. If there is one, it's what's already here, the hell we inhabit every day. Italo Calvino. I'm not good with Italian. <laughs> they were going to go anyway, so what could we do? What could we say? What could we possibly say that would keep any of it from happening? We prepared the conserved foodstuffs and salted fish. We made up bundles of clothing. We sewed an image of the Virgin into a fold of the mainsail. We prayed and prayed and prayed. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. They said they were going to deliver God unto other lands where they did not know him. Who are they? Who, where are those people who do not know God? And if they do not know God, then to whom do they pray when they are in pain? And before whom do they kneel when they have sinned? And if they are innocent of sin, are they happier and more free? Or are they more wicked? The men don't even know where they'll land or who will be waiting for them when they get there. Will they be dangerous, friendly? Will they kill our men folk? We were wondering those things, all those things amongst ourselves. They issued orders. Woman, do this. Woman, do that. We would pause on our way to complete an errand or gaze out to sea and look at the wooden monsters. How can it be that all this, children, home, a woman in their warm bed, isn't enough for them? How can it be that a shadow calls to them in the wee hours of the morning and they leave their homes as if bewitched to meet at the rendezvous? At night, the sails swelled and went slack, cracking like whips, a monstrous breathing sound. Pessimistic, the elder women told us over and over as we scrubbed the clothes against the stone, evil things will come to pass. This voyage will change the earth. It will change the earth, they said, and that is not good. All of us told our men, don't go, don't go, man, don't go. But they twisted away from us as if our hands were jellyfish that stung with an intolerable burning. We should know our place, that is what they said, and our place was the children shit, the laundry, drying the sausage and packing the olives and sardines. We women were going to die on that voyage, too. It will change the earth, the crones said, and the earth is us women. Every two months, a young doctor comes with a very old satchel. Once he explained to someone that it used to belong to a missionary and that the missionary had given it to him before he died. It seems they loved each other dearly because the little doctor keeps repairing the satchel with scraps of leather he flying, finds lying around. If once it was black, now it's red and brown and dark yellow. When word comes to us from the bus stop that the little doctor is coming, all of us gather. Mostly he examines the kids who make him shake his head. The kids have cloudy urine, rashes on their legs, and their arms look like red moss, and the kids scratch themselves and get blood under their fingernails. He listens to their lungs and sighs. Afterwards, he plays with them and makes the children listen to his heart. The kids don't sigh because the little doctor's heart is just fine, but our kids' hearts are not. It's the water, he says. It's the air. He says, it's the earth, he says. The earth is no longer what it once was. 
The earth changed, it changed from deep within, and the earth is us women. We bow our heads because even though we can't change the water, the air, or the earth, we can certainly feel guilty. There's always that. We should have left for the city when we had the chance to still get whatever work we could find or beg. We should have left behind our home, forest, ancestors, language, culture, our animals, our plants, our rivers, our dead, our gods, our voices. We should have gotten the kids out of here before their skin began to fall off in chunks and their lungs rattled and made the doctor sigh with discouragement. But what would we have then? What do we have anyway? We children, mothers and wives stay behind in the port weeping. It's always the same, isn't it? The men board the wooden monsters and we women stand here watching, feeling an ill wind in our hearts and a mix of dread and sorrow and who knows what other feelings that we keep to ourselves forever that no one will ever know how to put into words and that will be handed down and handed down and handed down. The wooden monster's sails go pot-bellied like pregnant women and off they go, rocked by the water and the salt like ghastly wombs, taking our men away with them. No one knows if they will ever return. And if they do, who will they have become? What things will they have done? Will we even recognize them? There's something the holy women say over and over again. Sin is more fatal than death because it kills for eternity. When they have a day off, they come home in a foul mood. The week's pay has all been spent on that stinking brew they sell there at the work site. They come back changed. Like men, no one would want to welcome into their home that no boy or girl would want to claim as their father. They are chock full of destruction. They have killed and killed and killed. Trees, monkeys, parakeets, snakes, fish. Killing is their job. Making gaps is their job. Making gaps so the black liquid can kill life is their job. The rest of it goes into the water and the air. They don't want to hear about the kid's raw arms and legs or their lungs that make the doctor sad. They want to hit the kids and hit us women. They want to hit each other and end up lying on the earth, hugging it like a mother, maybe, who knows, begging it to forgive them. The Mama Sabia, our medicine woman, says that we have been cursed for years, many years, more years than we even know how to count. How do we lift the curse, Mama Sabia? We ask her this when she gets gloomy, when she smokes the tobacco that lets her see things no one else can see, and she fills her shack with the fragrance of Palo Santo. By dying, by all of us dying, both them and us until there is nothing left but Mother Earth taking back what's hers. But if we all die, who will tell the story? Who? No one's going to want to hear such a sad story. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, Maria. Um, so, this is a this is a haunting story. I, I'm endlessly intrigued, uh, Samantha and Dorothy, by what you have done with gender and when you have chosen to insert the women. Because at the beginning, Samantha says they, and Dorothy, you say the women. I'm sorry, the other way around. Uh, Dorothy says the women kept going, Samantha says they. But then at that end of that first passage, uh, Samantha says we are the earth and the earth is us women. Right. So if you could both speak to that. That's an important piece of this in, in the original. Uh, the title obviously 
May I give you your magic sorry. wand? Yeah, sorry, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> the, the title obviously indicates the gender right off the bat, and I'm curious to know what ChatGP did. T did. <laughs> Copped out, what? basically. <laughs> what? Yeah. Okay. So this is, it's an interesting conundrum for a translator from a Romance language, <laughs> language because, you know, when you look up colonas in the dictionary, I think Colin's dictionary had like four different options. You could use uh, colonial uh, and, or a colonist, uh, tenant farmer, um, or it had one definition in Andean Spanish that said, you know, and I'm quoting the, the definition from the dictionary was an, an Indian worker on a colony farm. Mm -hmm. So that um, is not a compelling title for a story <laughs> <in> English. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think it's really important when you're, um, you know, beginnings are important. And this is probably like yeah. my editorial bias that, yep. you know, you have to have a strong beginning. Right. So that's why I chose n not to include the, there was no kind of gripping word that I could come up with that mm. indicated the gender that I felt would kind of deliver to the reader the power of the story that they're about to encounter. Mm. Um, and that's why if you read carefully the translation, I actually played around with the first sentence where, you know, your, your translation is correct. Mine, I, I took a big leap of faith, like, and I would never do this without consulting the author, and that's why this says draft. I would not, <laughs> you know, because you can see, Maria Fernanda, that that's not what you wrote. Like it said, they were going, se iban, right. and it's a, a reference to the fact that the men are going. But by using the title colonas and translating it as colonized, I set myself up a big problem, which was how do I put the women right in there at the front? So that's how I came to that solution with putting the women there. So we're going to get to Annalise's question, but I'm really glad that Sam brought this up because this was pure torture. The title was uh, delightful torture because it was, it was definitely, you know, we're dealing with a gendered language in Spanish, but we're also dealing with this powerful word that is actually not one that people use a lot, but it's very strong, colona, no? So um, I did something very different, you know, I decided to reach into the, the belly of the text because my feeling about it was, for me, that it had to be gendered. So I reached to the repeating refrain within the text. Um, and what, what Sam also said about that was, you know, I was going through, right, all of those definitions of colona, and I decided that it was the earth part that mattered the most to me. That said, I was losing the colonial sound, that sound that anyone could understand. But I'll tell you how I came to this, and this is how translators work, and all of you translators in the, in the audience know. You learn how to take chances in translation. And sometimes you're lucky enough to have authors along the way who encourage you to do so. And I have had the pleasure of translating a book by Angelina Muniz Uberman, who is a tricky, tricky person because she makes a lot of jokes in her titles, right? And jokes are terrible to translate, you know? So, <laughs> so fortunately, when you have a contemporary author, as Sam was suggesting, you can have a dialogue about this. And I think that's really important in this slam to acknowledge that all translation is collaboration. You're collaborating with the author on the page, and then if you're fortunate, as we have been and as we are right now, to collaborate with the author in real time. So I sacrificed a child <laughs> with this title in order to save another aspect of it. Voy a decirlo en español. Eh, 
El asunto es que yo en todas mis historias uso una sola palabra, siempre, como título. Ah. Es como una perversión mía. <laughs> well, the, the, the thing is, in all of my stories, I have one word titles. It's a sort of perversion of mine. <laughs> Me parece que, uh, por eso creo que es tan difícil para ustedes, porque yo siempre quise ser poeta, esto es un poco de historia personal, y eh, siempre he sentido que eh, la poesía tiene la capacidad de hacer que una sola palabra sea eh, todo un texto. Oh. Y, y ese, es mi, ese es mi esfuerzo, y digamos es por los títulos, buscar los títulos. So, you know, it's, it's a sort of, well, this is a little bit of personal background, but um, I've, I always wanted to be a poet. And what I liked about poetry is that I felt that with one word, you can convey, you have the capacity of conveying an entire text. And so that was, that explains my effort to constantly look for one word titles. Mm -hmm. Um, so I no. <laughs> That's very Kabbalistic of you. <laughs> I, I think the text is quite poetic. You know, the, the way you're employing repetition in the text. Um, and <laughs> but now we've lost Annalise's question because we just asked our own question. Oh. No, please, please do. Uh, my next question was about terrible uteri versus <laughs> ghastly wounds. <laughs> okay, so I, I was really happy with this one, actually, because of the syntax of the sentence, which is really difficult to bring into English yeah. without um, making it sound a bit contorted in English. So I had to kind of play around with it for a while. And... You know, the idea of these galleons as um, mm. monsters, mm. you know, I thought, um, and, and I, I really like your choice of wombs, too. It sounds more beautiful. My choice of wombs? <laughs> <laughs> I like yours, too. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> But that, you know, for me, there's a kind of monstrous um, connotation to the idea of these, like, big floating uteri that are just, you know, kind of... And the, the men inside them are, are like fetuses that are just, you know, floating away on the ocean. So that, that was the terrible... And I, I wanted to end it. I wanted to end this sentence with the terrible uteri. But it really was a product of the convoluted syntax and trying to make it sound as natural in English as possible. I well, I, I went for the ghastly wombs um, instead simply, <laughs> simply because um, I don't like the word terrible. It's just a thing with me. I don't like terrible. I don't like horrible. I just don't like those words. So that sometimes the kind of, you know, the translator's thinginess will come into the, the thing. But I like ghastly because there's something super horror story about the reality that this poetic text is speaking about. It is a freaking horror story. And if you've not read some of Maria Fernanda's uh, work, I will tell you this, you should not read it before bed <laughs> because she's given me many cinematic nightmares uh, <laughs> late at night. Uh, but they are, it is a horror story. I, I framed this as a horror story. So I was thinking of horror story vocab uh, that would pull from me because I always read this stuff out loud anyway, because I, I, you have to, but also from the reader that you would see on the page my take on it as a horror story. Um, and so ghastly is a good word for that. <laughs> no, no es terrible. Es, mm, gosh, what, what would the word? We have a dictionary. <laughs> 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 
So while, while we consult the dictionary, let's also kick it to the audience for a couple of oh. questions. Ororoso. Ororoso puede ser? Yeah. Estamos, uh, wait, let's see, let's see if we can, yeah, Sam suggests or, horroroso, tal vez, pero no, es. Ándale, horrible, come on, no. Alucinante, sí. Hair raising, yeah, but ghastly. Uh, well, we've brought out a dictionary, so this event has been a success. Um, between these images and the blow dryer, I hope you'll leave with something to talk with each other about. Um, I want to thank you for being an incredible audience today. I want to remind you that the World Best Voices Festival is hardly over. Uh, you can visit penorg slash festival to get tickets for the remaining events. Uh, be sure to follow at Penn World Voices. And uh, thank you so much for coming out to support translators today. <laughs>